Live from the Federal Judiciary Studios in Washington, D.C., the Federal Judicial Center and the United States Sentencing Commission present Sentencing and Guidelines, Multiple Counts. Welcome to Sentencing and Guidelines, Multiple Counts. This is the fifth broadcast that the Federal Judicial Center has produced in conjunction with the United States Sentencing Commission to help you with your work with the sentencing guidelines. In today's um, seminar, we'll focus our fact patterns um, by examining fact patterns. Our instructors who are from the Sentencing Commission will focus on Chapter 3, Part D of this guidelines manual, Multiple Counts. But before we do get started, um, I do have a couple of housekeeping things to go over. First, the length of the program. Today's program is about 90 minutes long, and we are going to take a short break, but that will occur about halfway when we're about midway through the material. And second, speaking of material, our written materials for today um, include a couple of different things. The packet includes not only our evaluations, but also a multiple count checklist and those fact patterns that I spoke about that our instructors will be using. So if you don't have any of those um, written materials, they are available on the FJC's website on the DCN, which is jnet.fjc.dcn. Third, participation. This program is for you, and we'll be better able to answer your questions that you might have regarding multiple counts if we know what they are. So we welcome your participation. Please feel free to fax in your questions at any time during the, today's program. In fact, we've already received a couple of faxes that we will get to um, during the program. Thank you so much for that. And the number will appear throughout um, the program up on the screen for you, so you can jot that down. We have reserved time to take them, your questions, both before the break and at the end of the program. And finally, CLE credit. This broadcast has been credited for CLE, Continuing Legal Education, in a couple of different, um, many actually, mandatory CLE jurisdictions. But in order for you um, to apply for state credit, you have to do a couple of different things. First, make sure that you sign the participant roster. It'll have a CLE box on the roster you'll need to check off. Also, um, the evaluation form itself has a CLE box that you need to fill out that evaluation information as well and return it to us at the FJC. Then have the site coordinator sign your attendance certificate and mail all that paperwork off to your state bar within 30 days of this broadcast. Now, for the most recent list of the jurisdictions that have approved this for CLE credit, along with more specific instructions than what I just gave you, that is also available on, with the written materials on the website, uh, the FJC's DCN site, rather. But that is all that I have for now. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our instructors today from the United States Sentencing Commission. They are Education and Sentencing Practice Specialists, Rachel Pierce and Krista Rubin. Thanks, Lauren. Good afternoon, and welcome to Sentencing and Guidelines, Multiple Counts. Our broadcast today is going to focus on the procedure under the guidelines for determining a single offense level for multiple counts of conviction. Having said that, the goal of our broadcast today is to provide you with a comprehensive working knowledge of these multiple count rules so that application of the rules becomes second nature to all of you. Lauren's already mentioned the packet of materials that Rachel and I are going to be referring to throughout the broadcast, and I'm going to turn it over to Rachel now to talk a little bit about our agenda for today. Sure, Krista. Our program today is going to begin with an introduction to the basic um, rules of guideline application. Uh, then we're going to review each rule individually using the fact patterns that we have to further illustrate each of the individual rules. And as we've mentioned before, you will find those, those fact patterns in your written material. In addition to Krista and I live in the studio today, you're going to, you're going to be seeing video clips from uh, taping footage of our ninth annual national seminar on federal sentencing guidelines. Rusty Burris is going to be interjected in between Krista and I to help with the instruction. And as always, please uh, remember to fax your questions in. The earlier the better. Um, we look forward to helping you with your analysis of your multiple uh, count application questions. We're going to start our discussion today with some background information regarding the multiple count rules. We find that when you are doing your analysis of these rules, it's pretty important for you to understand the rationale behind the reasons why the Commission put these 
rules into our guidelines manual. And as some of you already may know, there are basically two steps in grouping. For an introduction to these two steps and a little discussion about the background to get us started, we're going to go right away to a video clip of Rusty Burris. Rusty? So the, the approach to multiple counts is not to look so much at the counts, but to look at how many harms do we have really occurring here. And there's several ways which the determination is made as to whether you have a single harm or multiple harms. Now the grouping rules are the things that we look at to make the decision as to whether we have multiple harms or a single composite harm. You'll hear and even read in, in the case law, these were grouped under Rule A, these were grouped under Rule B. Uh, so so they're, they're referred to as rules, even though it's still just another guideline in the manual. Now, the steps in multiple counts, it, I think basically it can be broken down to two steps, and sometimes you don't even have to get to the second step, so I think it's really pretty easy in, in that regard. Step one is grouping. Grouping leads us to the determination as to whether we have one composite harm, even though we've got multiple counts of conviction, one composite harm, or whether we have multiple harms. First, you see... Grouping counts under Rule D, because we think that's the easiest rule to group under. And if you don't group them under Rule D, how about Rules A, B, or C? Do they work toward grouping? And we'll go through this process. If you have made the determination that you have more than one harm, then just like the five robberies, where we say, well, we're going to give some additional punishment, but we're not going to give five times the punishment that we would have for, for one robbery, the process the Commission sends you through is called incremental increases in punishment. It's, it's, we refer to it as sort of a unit process where you have to assign what are called units. We'll talk about that. And then these units will translate into additional offense levels, the additional offense levels representing this increase in punishment for these multiple harms. Let me elaborate just a little bit on the brief introduction that Rusty just gave us. When we do talk about multiple count application, we refer to the two steps. The first step being determining which counts you have form one single or composite harm. The next step being assigning units for additional uh, separate harms, if you will. And the grouping rules at 3D1.2 are actually written to reflect this. Uh, 3D1.2 reflects the, the first step, grouping uh, those counts that represent one composite harm, and 3D1.4, the assigning of units for separate and distinct harms. So let's just kind of review it again with uh, a slide that we have for you here. The first thing you need to do is establish whether your multiple counts represent one composite harm or separate distinct harms. Um, then, if need be, you move on to increase offense levels for any separate or distinct harms that you may have. We provide a mathematical uh, determination, if you will, to increase offense levels for various counts um, at 3D 1.4, and those increases are incremental. Uh, let's go back to Christos for a little bit more information on the rationale behind the multiple count rules. Thanks. At 3D 1.4, one, actually, in the introductory commentary to Chapter 3, Part D, the Commission has provided us with some additional information regarding the reasons for these multiple count rules. The first rule that we talk about in that introductory commentary is that these rules, their main goal is to determine a single offense level. And as you know, when you get to the sentencing guidelines table, which is the, the final, final step in guidelines calculation, you see that there is one offense level and one criminal history category. So the primary purpose of our multiple count rules is to come up with that one offense level. Secondly, these rules also function to prevent double counting. We don't want to punish a defendant twice for the same behavior. But on the other hand, these rules also provide incremental punishment for defendants whose multiple counts of conviction represent separate and distinct harms. Finally, these multiple count rules limit the impact of charging decisions, and you'll see from our fact pattern examples exactly how that works. Uh, Rachel, we have just given a brief introduction of the multiple count rules, but with any rule, it seems that there's always an exception. So let's talk about the exceptions for the multiple count rules. Sure, Krista. Actually, not all counts are subject to the multiple count rules, and in fact, there are some specific exclusions to the multiple count rules. Um, you're going to find those at 3D 1.1. Looking at 3D 1.1, this guideline tells us that any count for which the statute specifies a term of imprisonment to be imposed 
and also requires that that term of imprisonment runs consecutively to any other term of imprisonment imposed, then that's the type of offense for which the grouping rules will not be applied. In other words, that's the type of offense that will be excluded from grouping rules. Now, an example of such an offense would be, as many of you may know, a violation of 18 U.S.C. 924C, or the use of handgun during the commission of a crime of violence. This is one of those exceptions uh, to the rules of grouping. Now, other than those offenses that meet the definition of offenses excluded from grouping, all of the rest of the offenses are going to be subject to the grouping rules in Chapter 3, Part D. And as we explained in the beginning of our broadcast, there are two steps in the grouping process under Chapter 3, Part D. We're going to take a look at the slide that Rusty showed on his video clip for another example. The first step is grouping, which as Rachel mentioned is found under 3D 1.2. We advise that you start with grouping rule number D and then move on to grouping under rules A, B, or C when you're doing your analysis of multiple counts of conviction. The second step is the incremental increase step where you're going to be assigning units and these units will result in additional offense levels for defendants whose multiple counts represent separate and distinct harms. Now the first part of our broadcast today is going to focus on grouping under 3D 1.2 and we are going to go through each of the rules A, B, C, and D individually and so let's just do a quick review of these rules before we get started. At 3D 1.2, grouping rule A states that if you have multiple counts that involve the same victim and the same act, that these multiple counts of conviction represent one single composite harm and should be grouped together under this rule. Rule B is similar to rule A in that you still are looking for multiple counts of conviction that involve the same victim, but now we're looking at whether those multiple counts comprise two or more acts that were connected by a common criminal objective or common scheme or plan. Rule C states that when you have a specific offense characteristic or another adjustment to one of the counts that embodies the conduct of the other count, these offenses represent a single composite harm and should also be grouped under this section 3D 1.2C. Finally, the last rule is specifically for offenses that are based on an aggregate, either an aggregate amount of harm, an aggregate amount of quantity, or some kind of ongoing or series of behavior for which you can aggregate the, the amounts under application of the guidelines. Chris, if you don't mind, I'm just going to jump in here for a minute and uh, make a comment on the format of our program today. Now, the hard and fast rule for guideline application, as I'm sure a lot of you may know, and we reiterate time and time again, is that the book is to be applied in order. You start at the beginning of the book, chapter one, and work your way through to the end, applying the book in order. We have provided in your packet of materials a multiple count checklist that will assist you in doing that, uh, just going through step by step the process in order. However, we're sort of going to deviate from that. As, as we mentioned earlier, it seems that there's always an exception to the rule. And this is uh, one of the places in the guidelines that we do make an exception to this rule. And the exception that we make is that we advise when you're looking at the grouping rules at 3D 1.2 that you begin by looking at rule D. Uh, we know it's not the first rule, but we do suggest that you begin by looking at rule D. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we actually suggest this is because probably about 70% of the cases that you deal with involving multiple counts are going to be counts that can be grouped at Rule D. So in a sense, if you can get that out of the way at first, then you don't even have to fool with the other rules, which, which is nice. Um, so having said that then, Krista, why don't we just go ahead and get started then with the discussion of Rule D. Exactly. We are going to start our discussion with Rule D. And even though it's the last rule, as Rusty mentioned in the introduction, that it is probably the easiest to deal with. And as you will see, there are lists of the offenses or the guidelines that are included in the application of Rule D and others that are excluded from the application of Rule D. In addition, even though this is not a broadcast on relevant conduct, part of the reason why we advise grouping under Rule D first is because of the interaction between that specific rule and relevant conduct. Uh, but before we get into that discussion, we are again going to turn to Rusty Burris, and he's going to give us a brief introduction of grouping under Rule D. More counts than any other type of account are going to fall under this type of uh, rule. And that rule says that 
If counts use the same or similar guidelines, I got 50 counts of drug trafficking. Hmm, they use the same guideline. Each count uses the 2D1.1 drug trafficking guideline. And if that guideline is included at 3D1.2D, in other words, if you go into your guidelines manual to 3D1.2 under section D and we list the guidelines that are covered there and drug trafficking is listed there, uh, then you apply the guidelines as if for a single count application. Basically what you do, you add up the quantities of the drugs, you apply the guidelines one time. They have been grouped together. They're treated as a composite harm as such because what you've done, you've looked at the harm from each of the counts by aggregating the quantities. You're giving some consideration for all that harm when you apply the guidelines that one time. Now let me get back to the interaction between relevant conduct and Rule D. When you are applying the guidelines, when you are at the relevant conduct guideline, 1B1.3, there's a special provision under A2 of 1B1.3 that states, for offenses that are listed as included for grouping under 3D1.2D, those offenses are subject to what we refer to as expanded relevant conduct. And what that means is that the time frame for the acts that you're allowed to consider of the defendant and the limited acts of others has been expanded beyond the standard time frame of relevant conduct. The standard time frame of relevant conduct advises us that any act of the defendant that occurred during the commission of the offense of conviction, in preparation for, the, for that offense, or to avoid detection or responsibility for that offense of conviction, is relevant conduct. However, for the special guidelines that are listed at, 1B1, listed at 3D1.2D, but referred to in relevant conduct, section A2, those offenses now have been broadened. You can look at the acts of the defendant or limited acts of others that occur during the same course of conduct or common scheme or plan as the offense of conviction. And as you probably already know, when you are applying relevant conduct, if you have, let's say, five counts of drug trafficking, when you go to 2D1.1 and apply that guideline for the first time, you are not simply limited to the amount of drugs or the conduct of the defendant that occurred during that first count of conviction. You know that relevant conduct would allow you to expand your application to include all conduct of the defendant, all drug quantities that were involved in these counts of conviction that were part of the same course of conduct or common scheme or plan as that first count. So technically what you've done is you've grouped those offenses before you get to chapter three because of relevant conduct. Relevant conduct is allowing you to aggregate all of that quantity before you even get to your decisions about the grouping rules. But what we're going to do now is take a look at the list of offenses that are going to be included under this provision. The thing that's nice about uh, grouping at Rule D is that we do give you a, a list of offenses right there in the guideline and say these are the types of offenses that are groupable at Rule D. Um, also, these are the ones that we mention at, at relevant conduct, 1B1.3, that are subject to expanded relevant conduct. That's so right. let's take a list, take a look at the list of the types of offenses that are groupable at Rule D, things like drug trafficking, theft, money laundering, firearms. Um, you may notice that this list, while, has, while it has a number of different offenses, all of these offenses have something in common. Um, there, is, there is either a total amount of harm or loss, there is some sort of aggregate quantity involved, um, or some sort of other aggregate measure of harm or, or loss or these types of offenses represent behavior that is ongoing or continuous in nature. On the other hand, we also have a list of offenses at 3D1.2D that we specifically exclude from the application of this rule. Um, let's just take a look at those types of offenses, robbery, assault, kidnapping, uh, criminal sexual abuse, these types of things. The one thing you'll notice about these offenses is that they do not represent ongoing or continuous behavior. They actually represent separate and distinct harms for uh, each individual offense. That's right. So let's take a look now at specifically what Rule D says under the guidelines. And what Rule D says to us is that when you are grouping under Rule D, if counts use the same or similar guideline and if that guideline is included in the list at 3D1.2D, you're going to apply the guidelines as if for a single count application. 
So as I just mentioned in the example that we used earlier, where you have four or five counts of drug trafficking, what you have done is you've aggregated all of the quantity and used one guideline one time. That is probably one of the most important things to remember about grouping under Rule D. You want to make sure that when you have determined that these multiple counts are groupable under this rule, that you are applying the aggregate quantity, the aggregate conduct, the aggregate behavior of the defendant in one guideline at one time. That's right. We can't reiterate that enough, applying the one guideline one time at Rule D. And since we as trainers like uh, visuals so much, let's just look at a visual of Rusty's example of the grouping of the drug counts, what that might look like. Here we have four counts of drugs, and uh, we've got them separated out into their each count box. What you're going to do when you group at Rule D, remember you apply one guideline, one time, and the offense level for that group of counts is going to be based on the aggregate. So whatever quantity of, of drugs is associated with each of those counts of conviction is simply going to be added up and plugged into that one guideline for one application. Exactly. We're going to get started with our fact patterns now, and these fact patterns are going to deal with grouping under Rule D, mm -hmm. and so that we can further demonstrate the analysis to you. So in our first fact pattern, we have a defendant who is convicted of, in count one, transportation of a stolen motor vehicle. The defendant stole a car with a fair market value of $20,000. After, after the defendant stole this car, he transported the vehicle across state lines, after which he stripped off parts, which he then sold to an unknowing individual at a body shop in a neighboring state for $5,000. That comprises the conduct in count two, transportation of stolen goods, where again he sold the parts for $5,000. Now both of these counts go to guideline 2B1.1. Rachel, why don't we talk about the analysis of how these guidelines would work for the grouping of multiple counts? Sure. In keeping with the exception that we gave you uh, before we started our discussion of each of these rules, we tell you to look at Rule D first. So the first thing we're going to do with these two counts of conviction is look at 3D 1.2D and see are these offenses that are listed as being groupable at Rule D. And we see that when we look at our list at 3D 1.2D, they are listed. 2B 1.1, both of these offenses go to that guideline and they're both listed at 3D 1.2D. You'll also notice, as we talked about, that these are the types of offenses that are subject to the expanded relevant conduct that we were talking about earlier. And when you apply relevant conduct correctly, you've already, in essence, grouped these two counts together. So the application of the guidelines for these two individual counts will be the one guideline, one time, 2B1.1. The expanded relevant conduct is going to include both of these loss amounts and the aggregate amount of loss is going to be applied to that one guideline one time. So your total amount of loss is $25,000 and whatever the offense level calculation for that aggregate amount is, that's going to be the offense level for those two counts of conviction. Now let's look at our second fact pattern to have another illustration of grouping at Rule D. In this particular fact pattern, we have again two counts of conviction. Actually, we have more than two counts of conviction. We have uh, d two uh, different scenarios here. We have 10 counts of violation of uh, 18 U.S.C. 1956. It's a money laundering statute. The corresponding guideline for this violation is going to be 2S1.1, and the total value of funds laundered uh, through these 10 counts is $2.5 million. Now, the second group of counts that we're looking at is counts 11 through 15. Uh, this is a violation of 18 U.S.C. 1957, a different money laundering statute for which the corresponding guideline is 2S1.2. And the total value of funds laundered for these counts uh, is $150,000. So, Krista, how would we uh, go about an analysis for grouping of these counts? Well, in order to keep consistency, the place we're first going to look is at 3D 1.2D to see if these are types of offenses that are based on an aggregate. And if we look at 3D 1.2D, we'll find that 2S1.1 and 2S1.2 are both listed as groupable under Rule D. And this fact pattern is a little bit different than the one that we just discussed because now we're looking at two different guidelines. We're looking at 2S1.1 and 2S1.2 and trying to see if we can group these and base these on an aggregate under Rule D. They are both listed there. 
But as you will learn later in the broadcast, it doesn't necessarily mean that when, some, when two counts are listed as groupable under Rule D, that you are going to use Rule D for grouping those counts together. However, in the first 10 counts of 2S1.1, if you are applying relevant conduct correctly and you're using your expanded relevant conduct, you know that when you go to the 2S1.1 guideline for the first time, your expanded relevant conduct is going to aggregate the value of the funds laundered. And that is the primary determinant of the offense level under 2S1.1, how much money was laundered during this offense. So when you go there for the first time, you're going to aggregate the total amount of laundered funds that equals 2.5 million, and therefore you have grouped counts 1 through 10 under Rule D. Now let's take a look at counts 11 through 15, violations of Title 18, Section 1957. This guideline, 2S1.2, also considers the value of the funds laundered. This guideline is also listed as groupable under Rule D. So when you go to 2S1.2 for the first time, you are going to, using your relevant conduct analysis and your expanded relevant conduct, you are going to aggregate again the value of the funds that were laundered in counts 11 through 15 for a total of $150,000. Now, because both of these offenses are listed at Rule D, and when you consider relevant conduct, when you are looking at, let's say, 2S1.1 for the first time, the court could make a determination that the 2S1.1 counts, in addition to the 2S1.2 counts, are part of the same course of conduct or common scheme or plan as the offense of conviction, which would allow you to aggregate all of the funds laundered in all 15 counts. So the court could determine that they are part of the same course of conduct or common scheme or plan and the value of the funds from all 15 counts should be added and applied to the guideline that produces the highest offense level, which in this case is 2S1.1. So there we see a different example where you're using two guidelines that aren't the same but are similar, where you can use that to aggregate the conduct under one guideline one time. Now I want to jump in here and make a point off of that point that you just made that just because a guideline is listed at 2D1.1 as being groupable or subject to the expanded relevant conduct doesn't necessarily mean that you can group all of those counts together. What I mean by that is this. What you have to do sometimes is look at and evaluate the, the individual guidelines mm -hmm. and determine what is the characterization of the money involved. Right. For example, if you have two counts of conviction, one being a fraud count at 2F1.1 and the other being a tax count at 2T1.1, you have to examine those guidelines and what is the, the characterization of the money in those guidelines. The loss definition at 2F1.1 is the value of the property taken, damaged, or destroyed. Mm -hmm. Well, the determination for the money or the tax loss at the tax guideline is different. There are any number of formulas that you have to compute in order to determine what the tax loss is. So thinking back to the rule when applying um, or grouping counts pursuant to Rule D, you're going to be applying one guideline one time. Well, in a situation where you have a fraud count and a tax count, how are you going to aggregate the amount of monies involved in both of those counts and then plug that into one guideline? Well, and the simple answer is you're not able to do that because the two loss tables, if you look at those two guidelines, are also different. And so there's no mechanism for applying one guideline one time based on the aggregate amount of monies in, in both of those counts of conviction. On the other hand, um, just because a, uh, an offense, excuse me, is listed as excluded from grouping at Rule D, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it can't be grouped pursuant to some of the other rules, A, B, or C. So having said that, maybe we should move on with the discussion of some of our other grouping rules. Exactly. One thing that we need to point out before we get to grouping under rules A, B, or C is that the operation of these grouping rules differs from the operation of grouping under Rule D. We have repeated again and again that when you're grouping multiple counts under Rule D, you apply one guideline one time. Well, grouping under Rules A, B, and C doesn't quite work in the same way. So again, we're going to go to our principal training advisor, Rusty Burris, who is going to give us a brief introduction as to the 
mechanics necessary to group counts under A, B, or C? If counts group under rules A, B, or C, you apply the guidelines separately to get an offense level for each count. And then you use the highest offense level. Now let me give you some examples and that'll explain what this slide is, is saying to you. I have two counts of conviction. Uh, and I've looked these counts up in my statutory index and I see the guideline that's used for each of those and it turns out that I didn't group them under Rule D. So I know I didn't treat them as a composite harm by applying the guidelines one time for both of those counts. But maybe they're going to group under Rules A, B, or C. Now for count one, I looked in the statutory index, I know which guideline I'm using. I apply the Chapter 2 guideline. I apply the Chapter 3 adjustments all the way down to obstruction. Now, what that means, and you've looked at the worksheet, obstruction is at the bottom of the worksheet A. In other words, I've applied the worksheet A for count one. Now, for count two, I've done the same thing. I've looked in the statutory index and gone back to the chapter two guideline and applied chapter two and chapter three. And at the bottom of that worksheet A, I've got a number for that count as well. That number is called the adjusted offense level. So I have an adjusted offense level for each of those counts. What I'm going to do now is I've come up with that number and now I'm going to go through this process to decide how am I going to group these counts. Do they group under rules A, B, or C? As you can see, the operation or the mechanics, if you will, for grouping pursuant to rules A, B, and C is different than the rule for grouping at rule D, which is one guideline, one time. Let's look just a little bit more closely at the distinction between grouping at rules A, B, and C and grouping at rule D. If you have counts that group pursuant to rules A, B, or C under 3D 1.2, what you're going to do is apply the guidelines separately in order to get an offense level for each count of conviction. Then what you're going to do is use the highest offense level for the group. In other words, you look at all of the counts of conviction that you have, determining your offense level for each count separately, and whichever produces the highest offense level, that's going to be the offense level for the grouping of those counts under rules A, B, or C. And again, we're going to deviate just a little bit from the order of the book, and we are going to talk about grouping under rule C first. And the reason is that sometimes this rule has caused some confusion for people who are applying the guidelines because it is a little bit complex. So what we're going to start off with is looking at the exact language that's contained in 3D 1.2C. What 3D 1.2C says is that when one of the counts embodies conduct that is treated as a specific offense characteristic in or other adjustment to the guideline applicable to another of the counts. What that means is that when you are applying the guidelines, if in one of your counts a specific offense characteristic or a Chapter 3 adjustment to that count embodies the conduct of the other count of conviction, those counts are deemed to represent a single composite harm and therefore would be groupable under 3D 1.2C. One thing I want to point out, uh, as if you have noticed, is that that exact language says that you need a specific offense characteristic or other adjustment to. This grouping under this subsection would not include if a base offense level would embody the conduct or if a cross-reference would embody that conduct. You are looking specifically at a specific offense characteristic or a Chapter 3 adjustment to make that determination as to whether the conduct of the other count is embodied by that adjustment. So what we're going to do now is turn back to our fact patterns to help illustrate the analysis that goes on when you're grouping under Rule C. So here we go. Fact pattern three. We have a defendant who is convicted in count one of drug trafficking, a violation of uh, Title 21, United States Code, Section 841. And in count two, we have the defendant convicted of bribery. Uh, the corresponding guideline is 2C1.1. When we applied 2D1.1, there was an increase to the offense level that was given pursuant to 3C1.1, obstruction. And that offense level under 2D1.1 for count 1 was determined to be an offense level of 16, which does include that obstruction adjustment. The offense level for count 2, the bribery offense, is an offense level of 20. Let's talk a little bit about the analysis for this fact pattern. Okay, this is a good fact pattern to illustrate one of the questions that people may have when it comes to grouping under Rule C. Um, you will notice that when you're applying the guidelines for your, if you want to go ahead and go to go the, the slide, slide. 
when you're applying the guidelines for your uh, drug distribution count, well, first of all, let me back up a little bit. The first thing we want to do, as usual, is look at uh, 3D1.2D and see do we have offenses here that are listed as being groupable at 3D1.2D. And you will notice that they are. Both of them are guidelines that are listed at, at 3D1.2D, 2D1.1 and 2C1.1. Remembering the general rule, however, in grouping at rule D, you apply one guideline one time based on an aggregate amount. Well, when we look at these two counts, drug trafficking and the bribery of a witness, there's no conduct or amount of harm or loss or quantity or that type of thing to aggregate and plug into one of these guidelines. So then we want to move on to another one of the grouping rules to see if rules A, B, or C apply. So we're going to move on and we, we look as we are applying the guidelines for our drug trafficking count at 2D1.1. We go through the specific offense characteristics and we come to Chapter 3 and determine if any of our Chapter 3 adjustments apply. And as Krista walked you through in the presentation of the fact pattern, we are going to be applying the obstruction of justice enhancement in Chapter 3 because of the behavior uh, in the bribery count. Um, and so because of that application, that is going to embody the conduct of the bribery count, and that would be a Rule C grouping. The application of that Chapter 3 adjustment is going to thus embody the conduct of the bribery of the witness count, which is going to result in a Rule C grouping. Um, another tidbit to, to put in here at this moment is that actually in the obstruction guideline at 3C1.2, we have an application note 8 that specifically directs you anytime you have an obstruction offense, in this case the bribery of the witness, in conjunction with the underlying mm -hmm. offense, and in this case the drug trafficking, that is automatically going to be a Rule C grouping. So if it's not necessarily clear to you from the very beginning, if you miss it, so to speak, this, this is an example of a specific application note that's going to direct you that this is automatically a Rule C grouping. Another reason why it's very important that you make sure you read everything, all of the guideline, all of the application notes, all of the commentary, all of it. That's right. Another point I want to make uh, before I begin, before you, you get on with this, is that you may have noticed that the offense levels between the two counts were, were different and that the offense level for the drug count was actually higher, even though it is a Rule C grouping. Was. Or the bribery, I'm sorry. Right. The bribery was higher. And the question is, if you're grouping them together, does it matter that that is lower? And it, it doesn't matter. It's That's still right. a Rule C That's grouping. Right. Did you want to elaborate on that before we went any further? Or? Sure. It doesn't matter that the count with the obstruction enhancement is a lower offense level. And what we mean by that is when you calculate the drug guideline, you get an offense level of 16, and that offense level contains the adjustment for the obstruction under 3C1.1. The bribery count is an offense level of 20. So sometimes people get a little bit confused by saying that, well, if the offense level is lower, how can that possibly embody the conduct of this other offense which results in a greater offense level? And the truth is, when you group them together, you're choosing the highest offense level anyway. So the offense level for this, this group will be an offense level of 20. So the conduct has been embodied even though that one particular count may not have reached a higher level than the other count that was being embodied by that specific offense characteristic. That's right. Okay, we have one more fact pattern that's going to, that we're going to use to illustrate the grouping at Rule C. Mm -hmm. uh, fact pattern number four that you will find in your, your materials, we have a defendant who is convicted of one count of burglary, which is a violation of 18 U.S.C. 1153. The corresponding guideline for that is going to be 2B 2.1. The loss amount, there is a specific offense characteristic at 2B 2.1 that provides an increase for any loss uh, that, that occurred during the offense. It's a two-level increase. Now, that loss amount is going to represent the value of the stolen property, which is going to comprise the conduct in our second count of conviction, which is a violation of 18 U.S.C. section 662. The corresponding guideline for this count of conviction is going to be 2B 1.1. Krista, how would you walk us through an analysis of grouping these counts? Well, again, we are going to start by looking at Rule D to see if these are offenses that would be groupable because they are based on an aggregate. If you look at 3D1.2D, you will see 
that 2B 2.1, the burglary count, is specifically excluded from grouping under Rule D. And as you know from our first fact pattern, 2B 1.1 is included for grouping under this subsection. But because both of them are not, we cannot group these under Rule D. Now, as Rachel mentioned, when you are applying the burglary guideline, 2B 2.1, and you get to the subsection that deals with loss, the value of the property taken, damaged, or destroyed is the value of the property that was possessed in count two. So when you apply the burglary guideline, the loss calculation will embody the conduct of the other count of possession of stolen property. So you then have a rule C grouping. And that's a good example of when you have two counts of conviction that represent a single composite harm. We have the burglary, we have the possession of the stolen property, the stolen property was taken from that burglary, so that is why Rule C works in the way that it does. We have a single composite harm, the loss from that second count has already been considered in the first count. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have a Rule C grouping in this situation. Now Krista, what happens if you have two counts of conviction and there is a specific offense characteristic in one of the counts that is there but it's not applied for whatever reason. Is that still a Rule C grouping? And if so, could you explain that to us? Sure, it absolutely is. Um, we have certain situations and where you will have a specific offense characteristic that may not be applied either because of a specific instruction in the guidelines or because the definition won't allow the application of that specific offense characteristic. And let me give a, an example of that. If you have a situation where a defendant is convicted of one count of bank robbery and one count of assault on the teller during that bank robbery, let's say in this situation, in this set of facts, when the defendant robs the bank and injures the teller, her level of injury does not get to the level of bodily injury as described in the guidelines manual. So when you're applying the robbery guideline, when you get to the specific offense characteristics for injury, you are not going to be able to apply that offense level or those additional offense levels for bodily injury, simply because the teller's injuries did not rise to the level as defined in 1B1.1. However, after you apply the robbery guideline and then you apply the, ass the assault on the assault guideline, what you will find is that when you go through the grouping rules, you could still argue that Rule C applies because that specific offense characteristic for injury would still embody the conduct of, of the assault. So it is possible that you could have a situation where a specific offense characteristic is not necessarily given, but for the purposes of the grouping rules, the conduct would still be embodied from the other count. One of the things that I, I like to use when I'm explaining grouping pursuant to Rule C is, is say that if you've got some sort of physical nexus, so to speak, between the two counts of conviction, either a specific offense characteristic or a Chapter 3 adjustment, that's going to be a Rule C grouping. And that might be a good way to think about it if you run across a situation like this where you might be thinking twice because you didn't apply it. It didn't rise to the level, in this case, the injury didn't rise to the level mm -hmm. of, of what it is needed in order to apply that specific offense characteristic at the robbery guideline. However, if that physical nexus, so to speak, is there, then that's all you need in order for it to be a, a Rule C grouping. That's right. That's right. Well, it's almost time for us to go to our break, our five-minute break, but I want to go to Lori first and see if we have any questions. Yes, we do, actually. This is one of those questions that uh, came in earlier this morning. This is from the Eastern Kentucky. And um, the question uh, at the bottom says, can these offenses be grouped under 3D 1.2? If so, how? Now, the facts are a defendant pled guilty to two counts of theft concerning programs receiving federal funds in violation of 18 U.S.C. Section 666-A1A and 10 counts of engaging in monetary transactions in property derived from specified unlawful activity and this is in violation of Title 18 U.S.C. 1957. Briefly, the defendant who was employed by a hospital as a plant operations manager stole equipment and supplies such as air conditioning units, lumber, etc. from the hospital. Also, the defendant set up a bogus bank account. In his capacity as a plant operations manager, he would bill the hospital for services that were never performed and then have the payments transferred or deposited into his bogus bank account. 
It's a good question. And looking at the statutes of conviction, when you go to Appendix A to decide which guideline you're going to use, for the violation of Title 18, Section 1957, we know those 10 counts, the applicable guideline is 2S1.2. For a violation of Title 18, Section um, 666A1A, we are given two options. We can either go to 2B1.1 or 2F1.1, depending on the specific facts of the case. Regardless of whether you use 2B1.1 or 2F1.1, the analysis is still going to be the same. And that is, you start with your first two counts of conviction for either the theft or the fraud, 2B1.1 or 2F1.1. We look at Rule D, 3D1.2D, to see if these offenses are listed as groupable under this subsection. And they are. When you then are applying your guidelines for that first count of the theft of property, you will use your expanded relevant conduct you will aggregate the conduct of the defendant, the loss involved in these transactions and the criminal conduct, and you will aggregate all of that behavior applying one guideline one time, whether it's 2B1.1 or 2F1.1. Well, let's set that aside for a moment and deal with the 10 counts under 2S1.2. When you look at 2S1.2 and when you look at your grouping rules, again, we're going to start with Rule D. When you look at Rule D, you'll notice that 2S1.2 is listed as groupable under this subsection. Therefore, what you're going to do is very similar to what you did with those theft counts. You are going to look at that money laundering behavior. And using relevant conduct, you are going to apply 2S1.2 one time. You apply one guideline one time, and you are aggregating the value of the funds that were laundered under that money laundering behavior. You're not going to be including the loss that was used, that was obtained, or the harm that resulted from the theft. You are only looking at the money laundering behavior in order to apply that money laundering guideline. Just as when you apply either the theft guideline or the fraud guideline for the first two counts, you're only going to consider the loss that occurred because of the theft. Then what are you going to do? Because now you have two count groups. You have one count group of 2B1.1 or 2F1.1, and one count group that deals with the money laundering behavior under 2S1.2. Now, even though both of these offenses are listed as groupable under Rule D, we have different characterizations of the money. Under 2B1.1 or 2F1.1, the loss is the value of the property taken, damaged, or destroyed. Under 2S1.2, the determination is based on the value of the funds laundered. So we are not going to be able to take all of the conduct involved in all 12 of these counts and aggregate that under one guideline one time. So we are not going to be able to group 2B1.1, that count group, with 2S1.2, that count group, under Rule D. We have to find another grouping rule in order to do so. Well, when you are applying your 2S1.2 guideline, there is a specific offense characteristic that states that the defendant knew that the funds laundered were the proceeds of a specified unlawful activity that you would increase by a certain amount of levels. And I believe that that specific offense characteristic would apply in this case. The defendant knew that what he was doing in order to obtain these illegal funds was an illegal activity. So that specific offense characteristic is going to embody the conduct of the theft of property. So we have a Rule C grouping in this case. We've used Rule D in order to aggregate the first two counts and the counts of the money laundering. But then in order to put those together to come up with a combined single offense level, we're going to group these two count groups under Rule C. Do we have any other questions, Lauren? Yes, this would be our last one. So if anybody else has any questions out there, be sure to fax them in. We'll get to them uh, at the end of the program, uh, after we take our break and, well, at the end of the program. Um, now, this last uh, fax that we have here is, again, um, whether these counts can be grouped, and if so, how. Um, the defendant is convicted of three counts of unlawful possession of a firearm, and all the counts arise out of a single incident involving three different weapons. Well, again, let's start with looking at Rule D. When you look at Rule D, unlawful possession of a firearm falls under guideline 2K2.1. 
uh, we have three counts of 2K2.1. So the analysis is going to be that you are going to group these offenses pursuant to Rule D. You're going to aggregate the number of firearms, aggregate the conduct of the, of the defendant, and apply the guidelines as if, as if they're group of one to Rule D, which they are. Right. One guideline, one time, based on the aggregate amount of, in this case, guns. So once again, applying 2K2.1 based on however many guns are involved in the offense, and that's going to be your single offense level for these, I believe it was three counts of, of conviction. Exactly. Please don't forget to fax us in your questions. We're going to take time now and take a five-minute break. So we'll see you after the break.